Hello, I'm Lauren and welcome to Improving the World. I'm an international improviser based in Hong Kong and I speak to amazing improv women from all over the world. Today, being no different, I am talking to Daniela Landert. She is a lovely Swiss individual living in Zurich, Switzerland, and we are talking about the linguistics of improv. And by that, I mean that she is a linguist and she is an improviser. And where the twain meet, you have Daniela. We are talking about talking and we are looking at how improv fits into an academic space. This one's pretty nerdy and great. I hope that you enjoy. And by the way, have you subscribed yet? If you haven't, go and hit that subscribe button and enjoy. Thank you for joining us. We are talking today about language, hence the smattering of letters behind us, because you are a linguist and an improviser, and it sounds from your scheduling, from what I understand, that you are probably even keel fighting for which one takes more of your time, and now you're in a place where you're doing a mixture of the two of them, which is so interesting. Let's dive in, because you are living in an academic sphere in your work life. Tell me, what is improv when we're talking in the world of academics? Well, in my world, at least, in the world of linguistics, improv is very much non-existent so far, which I would like to change a bit. I mean, I won't be able to change the entire world of linguistics, of course, but I would like to do my bit in putting improv on the map there. As I mentioned already, I'm a linguist, so I work at university, which means I do research, how language is used to communicate. I teach at university as well how to analyze language and so on. And I'm also an improviser. And a while ago, I managed to merge these two things that I feel very passionate about by finding funding for a research project in which I can actually analyze the language of improv. That's really exciting. So cool. What is the language of improv? Do we have a definition? Are you mapping that out? Is that yet to be defined? Well, of course, it's not a kind of a separate set of language of improv, but what I'm really interested in is how language is used in improv, for instance, to create humor or to create characters or just simply how dialogues in improv work. So, for instance, in one of the studies that I've carried out so far, I looked at repetition, repetition, repetition in improv. Because improvisers repeat a great deal of lines of things that they do, and they do that to create certain effects for instance, to create humor or to establish characters and so on. So I'm trying to find out how that works. And then I also want to compare how language is used within improv to other contexts. So one of the things that we compare improv to is scripted fiction, for instance, films or television series, which of course also uses language in similar ways to which it is used in improv. But there are differences because films and television series are scripted, so their language is being revised and edited. And so I'm interested in looking at what this does to language, how language is used differently there. And then another context in which I also compare to improv is spontaneous conversation, because that shares with improv that it's also spontaneously produced, it's not scripted, but it serves different purposes. So whereas improv or also films and television series, their language is used to present fictional content to an audience. In spontaneous conversation, that's not the case. So that tends not to be fictional and has different functions. To make this a bit more concrete, you ask, well, what's the language of improv? With the repetition example, if we look at linguistic research so far, there has been a lot of comparison between fictional dialogues and dialogues in spontaneous conversation, but always based on scripted fiction. There has been a lot of research on repetition in both domains. If you look at repetition in spontaneous conversations, that's often been associated with a lack of ability to produce language without using repetition. Okay, mm -hmm. so when we communicate, real time without scripting and so on, we have cognitive constraints of how fast we can produce language and how fast we can understand what the other person is saying. So using repetition helps me as someone who speaks to create content without being under too much pressure, whereas my recipient can understand more easily what I'm saying because there is some redundancy in what I'm saying. I have like a billion questions. Okay, number one, if I wasn't talking to you, a linguist, and someone yeah. said the language of improv, the first thing that I would think is that it is more than just the spoken word. I would think about the body. I would think character as mm -hmm. being a way to communicate. I would think about the mimed objects and the physicality in that context. And I would also think about the spoken word. But because you were looking at this in an academic space and you were talking from a linguistic perspective, do you take those other pieces away or are they intrinsically linked so that sometimes you're not able to pull them apart and you have to look at language, how it 
work. Yeah. Okay. Tell me. So at the moment, I'm mostly looking at language that's being produced. So what we do in very practical terms, we make recordings of improv shows and then we transcribe them. So I have a team and at the moment they do most of the transcribing. So we transcribe these shows and then we look at these dialogues. And it's not just the words that are being said that we transcribe, but also the pauses, how long exactly the pauses are in kind of tenths of seconds, how much overlap there is, what exactly is overlapping with what and things like that. So very detailed transcriptions that we produce and then we analyze. But of course, as you said, you cannot always take it completely apart from the nonverbal communications. Only looking at the words that are being said is a very simplistic view on communication. And so you have to also look at some nonverbal communication in any case, like nodding and things like that, because otherwise you cannot make sense of the words, right? And what I also want to do, but I haven't done so far, is at least for selected scenes, selected moments, to then really look at the interaction between the nonverbal and the verbal communication. But at the moment, I'm just still looking at language and the words because there's just so much to do there. You mentioned conversation, and mm. this is something that I think about a lot. And I think that when people come to improv because they are wanting to work on confidence or public speaking or sales or presentations, this kind of thing, they are oftentimes scared of the eyeballs being on them and the speaking at the same time. So this duality creates a little bit of the brain breaking. So because of that, I often talk to people about the fact that when you're having a conversation, when you're in a business meeting or one-on-one -on -one having a coffee, you are improvising your language, probably, unless you're a robot. And so because of that, it's really just the same thing. And we're just taking that context and we're shifting it. And now you're doing something a little bit different. So talk to me about how you look at this and this idea of a natural conversation versus being on an improv stage where you're also organically creating language. I think what's really similar in both settings is that we create something collaboratively, right? So usually if you have a spontaneous conversation, ideally we're not just talking over the other person and not listening to what they're saying, but we, yeah, I mean, if you look at conversation, there is very much this kind of tag, tag, tag. Okay, so person A says something, person B adds onto it, person C joins in and so on. And that's exactly the same principle that we try to create on an improv stage. That's different from scripted fiction where there is someone who creates all the dialogues and then we distribute the parts and then it's just enacted as if it were collaborative but it's actually not right so someone thought about everything in advance whereas on the improv stage and in spontaneous conversation we don't do that there is not a single individual who thinks ahead and plans the conversation but it's being discovered collaboratively by just always responding to what the previous person said and I think that's a very strong similarity there and something to build on and I think a lot of the stress from doing improv by beginners comes from this idea of okay I have to know where this is going and have to be the person who creates the script but you don't have to be that person right because there is no script so you just act in the same way in which you would do in a spontaneous conversation trusting that the other person will also add something to that yeah and please don't try to be that person someone no, watching this no, exactly yeah and you're not really improvising are you and that planning ahead is sort of undercutting what it is that we're working at another thing bonus for you because i'm just thinking this as i am listening to you speak so i've interviewed many many people now in this life and on this YouTube channel. And when I do the editing for these videos, I try to take out as many filler words as I can. Even though the video jets a bit, I think it makes for a more flawless listening experience. And I also think that it adds to the quality of the content. So I take out the ums and the uhs and what have you. And it's fascinating to me that regardless of how native someone is, many, many people, almost all, still use a selection of filler words. And as you said, this is about the brain catching up, but also how you practice your language, how comfortable you are, and so many different things. I don't need to tell you that. What's mm -hmm. interesting about having a conversation with you is that you do not use many filler words at all, so thank you, because my editing will be easier. But additionally, maybe this is a great opportunity if someone's watching this and they either do or don't realize that they, when improvising or when having natural conversation, use a lot of ums and uhs and likes, how can they make a shift to remove those so that they have a more seamless dialogue. What do you think, Daniela? Well, as a linguist, I would say uh, that you don't actually have to remove all of them. So there is a lot of research and actually we are currently working on a project where we're looking exactly at that, at such filler words, which are sometimes in linguistics called 
presentation markers or sometimes planners, which already shows you the kind of different evaluations. So if you type them as hesitation markers, it's, you don't quite know what to say, you hesitate first. If you talk about them as planners, it says, well, it's something that you do because you're taking some time and signaling to your audience that you're thinking very carefully about what's coming next. And what I would advise is to think about their function, how to use them. We should have done this interview after the pilot study so I could tell you a bit more about how some improvisers at least use filler words because they use a lot of them, even though you might not notice if you're not looking for them. If you just watch their show, it seems all very fluent. But if you look for filler words, you can find many of them. And they can be used very strategically, for instance, to create characters. So we found one character that uses lots and lots of filler words. I'm sure the performer didn't think of, okay, I'm going to use filler words for that character, but it's part of the attitude that's being performed by that character. So it can be related to identity characteristics like the status that you want to display. It can be related to gender. There are gender differences in the use of planners and filler words. I would really encourage people to use them consciously. I mean, it's one of the interesting things because it's something that you cannot control entirely, right? If you go on stage, you try to not use filler words, you will use even more of them. Um, now I just used one. We should probably change the topic because no, I'm now I... That oh. one, that one makes the point perfect. Uh, <laughs> but go on stage and try to use a character that just uses a lot of arms and see what happens then. Play with that in the same way in which you play with pauses or with the vocabulary that you use. Use that as an inspiration rather than, oh, I want to get rid of that. If you could take the map of linguistics and put improv on it somewhere, how would you want improv to be viewed in this arena? How do you want people to speak about it and see it and think? Well, first of all, I want people to see it and speak about it, which at the moment is really not done sufficiently in my view. And improv is really exciting from a linguistic point of view because it shows you language. As I said before, I mean, so far often dialogues have been compared between scripted fiction and spontaneous conversation, but then you actually conflate two different dimensions. You conflate the dimension of fiction, non-fiction, and the dimension of spontaneous and scripted. And with improv, you can take these apart and you can learn more about how language actually works and what functions of language are related to spontaneity and which functions are related to fiction, if you want. So I want to put this on the map out there also because it will help visibility for improv if it's being seen and perceived alongside other forms of artistic expression to be taken a bit more seriously, perhaps in that way. At the moment, my goal is very kind of simple. I just want to get to a stage where I can talk about improv without each time having to explain what improv actually is, which can be really frustrating. Because if I go to conferences, I have typically a 20 minute slot where I can present my research and a 10 minute slot where we discuss about whatever I presented. So in this 20 minutes, I have to explain what improv is before showing my results and my method and all that, mm -hmm. which of course already takes a bunch of time. What's even worse is a discussion slot because what happens usually is that in this 10 minutes, typically the first question that someone asks is, well, but you know, how can you know that this is improvised? Because probably the scene that you just showed us, I mean, how can you know that they didn't prepare this in advance? Okay, so you have a room full of academics who've never seen improv, or perhaps even worse, they've seen one bad improv show, and now they think they know what improv is, and they try to explain to you what improv is. And so you start in this academic setting, you know, all well made up, and so on, blah, blah, blah. you know, I'm actually quite sure that they didn't prepare that, and so on. But how, you, you cannot prove that. It's impossible to prove, because I didn't, put these performers under 24 hours video surveillance to be able to show, no, they didn't, they didn't prepare that. And so I've had so frustrating experiences because my entire 10 minute discussion slot was just taken up by this one person who, whenever I gave a response said, yeah, well, but I still don't believe you because it's still possible that they prepared this joke and so on. And yeah, well, can we please talk about the content of what I'm trying to present rather than talking about improv being improvised or not? Yeah. I have a really not academic conference idea for you. Do what you will. What if you brought a bell and you played New Choice and at the end oh, of yeah. 20 minutes, you said, we're gonna go into the 10 minute question section now and I want you to know that the question that I usually get first is how do we know this is improvised? I can only guarantee, but I cannot prove anything. And now we're gonna play a game of New Choice. And then you can take questions and if you're like, I don't like that one, ding! And then, <laughs> yeah. and then you're doing improv while you 
you're doing your Q and A. Daniela, is improv different when we're talking about different languages? So as a person who is living in Europe and you're doing your improv because you're in Zurich in German sometimes, but in English sometimes because of your capabilities and interests, you are researching the improv that's being done in English do you do the art in one language and play it differently in another research? How does it work when you look at it across language barriers or capabilities? I think there are different levels to the question, right? So on the one hand, you have different improv cultures. Like, I don't know, the improv culture in the US is different from the one in Europe. And within Europe, there are differences. And between Canada and US, there are differences and so on. And so this is partly related to language, but also partly to just the bigger kind of improv culture. What's improv in that place, in that situation that kind of interacts with language to some extent. In addition to that, just on a very personal note, I realized that I have very different associations depending on the language language in which I play. So if you, I don't know, show me a picture as an input, I don't know, for a scene, I will have different associations of what to do with a picture, depending on whether I am performing in German or in English. I play different characters, even within German. I mean, my native language is Swiss German, but then the German is used for written language. So certain types of characters, I perform more when speaking standard German compared to when speaking Swiss German. That is differences, which I think is just very closely related to what kind of cultural associations we have where we move when using a certain language, what, what we encounter while using a language, and that builds up our associations that we have, which we then also use when doing improv. In terms of the research that you're doing, who's the recipient? So someone's watching this and they're thinking, oh, this is so interesting, this discussion about how language works, and I'm going to think about how often I say it. And like, beyond that, you finish this research and this poor student who has to count the seconds between the words. When this is done and you have something that's a tangible piece of information, is this something which will only live on a white paper or will this be in a space or place that people can digest it if they're improv nerds and they want to? I absolutely want to do that. So at the moment, I'm mainly doing research like for an academic setting. It also happens because I perform improv myself, I teach improv, and so I bring this with me. It's not something that I leave at the office door. So for instance, I've taught a class once on repetition in improv scenes, which was very much informed by the findings that I had on the study where I analyzed repetition in improv. And so we practiced or we looked at all the different uses of repetition on stage. I really enjoy that because then that also gives me inspiration again for other research projects because and I can see something that I haven't thought about. And so I want to go back to my data and see whether I can find that there as well. I haven't really done any kind of writing for an improv audience yet, but I would like to find ways of doing that or perhaps in a different form. I don't know yet, in addition to just the one-on-one -on -one teaching or a group teaching, but that's something that I would very much like to do. What I also want to do, and quite soon actually, is to have this kind of a thing like improv talks. So where we just have some other people here also in an academic setting and through improv and I would like to have this setting where people can present where I can present to improvisers and talk to improvisers about what I've investigated and invite other people who also do the same. We can have a discussion about all that and kind of trying to contribute to some theory building of improv, analyzing improv from a more theoretical point of view. That's certainly not for everyone. Not everyone has to like it, but you know, there are some improv nerds out there who I think could enjoy that and I would also like to invite them to also think about this or bring their expertise in other areas to yeah. improv and contribute to that discussion. I could really easily see that being something where you go to, let's say, Edinburgh Fringe, and it's such a massive festival. There are many different symposiums and talks and things. You could very easily have a theater with 150 seats be a you know, 4 p.m. afternoon talk, or they do a lot of kind of morning talks before the day gets going, and it would be lovely to see coffee and pastries and improv nerding or something. That would be lovely. Monday could be language. I'd like to name it exactly that, coffee and pastries and improv nerding. <laughs> <laughs> that's my copyright for the day. Now, you have done some really fun stuff in the Zurich space about creating a physical space so that you can have people from different improv contexts come together and some sharing and what have you of the art and the organization and what's going on in the city. Do you feel that having an improv space changes the way that the improv community functions in terms of either 
fostering or hindering different people have different plans and goals and what does it do to an improv community to have a hub? What do you think? Well, at this point, I can only speculate on that, but I hope that it will foster this kind of exchange. And that's basically why we set that up. So here in Zurich, there's a lot going on in terms of improv. So we have one very established, very professional improv group that has been around for 15 years. And they've took many, many classes. They have their own theater and so on and so forth. Because of that, all these people who took classes over the years, they created their own groups. And so at this point, we have, I don't know, anything between 20 and 30 different improv groups just injury of all kinds of different levels and different motivations for doing improv but much of this has been really dispersed across the city and there hasn't been all that much exchange between the groups everyone is finding their own venues and doing their own thing me personally i'm, I'm a member of different improv groups three at the moment and i've always found it very frustrating to have to search for these spaces where we can do our things. And I've often had these ideas of, oh, I'd like to do this or that. For instance, these nerd talks, you know, or something like that. But then the first thing is you have to find a space and then you have to pay for it and you have to organize it and you have to advertise it. Just, you know, simply this advertising for all these small shows and you can't really build up an audience because one time it's here and another time it's there. And how can people make sense of that? I've invested so much time and energy into organizing these things that at some point I thought, it would just be so nice to have one space where all this can happen and that also is recognizable to the audience that they know, okay, improv is taking place there. That's where we can go. Also open to people where they can do their experiments and that they can come and say, oh, I have this crazy idea. I would like to, I don't know, invite this and that person or do this and that. And can I use this space for that? So we've organized such a space now and it's just opened up just before the Corona lockdown. So now it's already set up. There is a stage, there is lights, there is everything, a bar. And I'd like to have a huge opening party at this point and get started with wonderful programs of shows and things like that which would be really open to everyone who wants to get involved. And I would like to have as many different groups as possible involved in there to really foster that kind of exchange. But I think at the moment, we still have to wait a bit for the situation to pass by. And I hope that it will be a space where new ideas can be created and the exchange can happen. Yeah. Well, you said that there's a bar. So when it's open, I'm ready. Just yeah, yeah. Please come. Please come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Daniela, what are your words of wisdom, please? You can speak to the younger version of you, your improv community, or someone who just finds this video at 3 a.m. and they're hanging around the internet Googling stuff. What do you want people to know? What are your words of wisdom? Based on what I've talked about today, I think for me, for a long time, I had these two different identities. I was a linguist at day and an improviser at night, more or less. And it was really inspiring when I found a way of bringing this together and trying to see how the two sides can inspire each other, I can benefit from yeah, combining these experiences. And so I would like to invite everyone to just think about what they, on one hand, can bring to improv, but also how they can take improv outside of the improv sphere and apply in their own life and what can happen if they just combine these different identities and bring this together and i would like to see more people also bringing the different expertise into improv beat on stage or being around it and not just thinking of improv as being this that's improv and that's what I do when I do improv, but exploring what there can be based on other skills and other types of expertise that one has. Yeah, that's a gorgeous idea. I really like that. And how the art could grow if we had Christopher the accountant. It's like, I have an idea, everyone. Go with me. A show about numbers. Okay, sure. And also in terms of the work that you're doing, how can people contribute? So you're gathering a data warehouse and what are you looking for? And let's make a call out. What should people send you? What do you need? Yes. So as I mentioned before, we're working with recordings of improv shows, which we transcribe. And we were supposed to travel to the US and collect lots of data, record many improv shows and then work with that. And now because of the entire corona situation, this is not going to happen. I don't know when we will be able to go there. So I'm really interested in receiving videos of improv shows, which need to fulfill a number of criteria so that I can use it in my project, which is, first of all, they need to be recorded in a way that we can understand the sound well. So 
the recording quality need to be relatively good. The performers should be native speakers of English because that's just the limitation of the project. And they should be relatively professional. So not kind of first year improv students having their first show type of thing, but kind of established improvised with a lot of experience and a lot of training doing improv shows. Mm -hmm. And so far, we've worked with data that has been commercially available, video recordings, mostly by TJ and Dave, Middleditch and Schwartz. So that means that we already have quite a lot of data from white men doing improv. And so I'm especially interested in expanding that, bring some more diversity into my data. So if you know of shows that can also do that, then that's even better. Got it. So interesting. There's usually not very many white men in improv. I'm so shocked. Okay, so the world is open back up. We are all fine, well, and dandy. People are in Zurich and they want to come hang out, take a workshop, visit the bar and see a show at your nifty new establishment, buy you an incredibly overpriced Swiss drink, Switzerland. <laughs> Where can people find you on this giant internet? How can they find you and come hang out and do stuff? They can find me on Facebook. That's relatively easy. There are not many people with my name. Wonderful. Thank you so very much for your time, your energy, your effort, and your kind contributions to science and the world of language. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It was a great pleasure. Yeah, good to have you. All right, everyone, this is Improving the World. I'm Lauren, and there's more where that can go. Hi, all. So, did you love the video? If you did, please say kind and wonderful things in the comments down below. Do subscribe. Thank you so very much. And look for more Improving the World. Thanks.